All right, so we're going to start with Therax today, PTA 205, because we're going to continue our lecture on the ever-loving PNF that we started the other day that pretty much fried your brains. So let's start with just kind of an overview and a review. What do you guys remember about PNF other than that was a lot of stuff, oh my God, why did you do this to us? D1, D2. Okay, good. That's that's a good chunk. What was the term called that we're trying to get? Good multiple movements. What was the term we're, tra we're called trying to get from muscle energy flow? What was that term called? The basic concept of PNF. Irradiation. Good, right? Almost sounds like we're going to Chernobyl or something. We're going to irradiate their body. And that, you know, again, like you said, D1, D2 is a good idea, but that's not all of it. And we're going to see that today, that's not even a third of it. And the stuff we're going to talk about, you'll see that even the stuff I'm going to talk about today is like thousand foot level. You can get down into the weeds even further. Um, we started talking about the patterns last time, right? And we got this lovely confusing thing that I made out these little write-ups for you guys. So I got a question from the last time about the elbow, and then I evidently looked ahead at the knee. And why does the knee, elbow and knee say extension flexion? So I wasn't 100% sure on that. I knew that you could do them in either an extension or flexion of the elbow. So I wanted to go, and I contacted my old, um, my program director, or my, well, my new program director from Penn State, because she's a PN, she literally is a PNF guru. And I said, well, why do we do... Why is it that, you know, I do tend to do elbow flexion, but it says you can do elbow extension. And she said there's actually a whole theory of study on PNF that when you bend the elbow, it stops irradiation. It says that basically by bending the elbow, you're kinking the nerves. And so therefore, irradiation doesn't occur. So she's like, there's a whole side of PNF that says that elbow should stay extended through the whole thing so that the irradiation occurs from distal to proximal and proximal to distal. And I went, wow, you couldn't have come up with something simpler because that's really complex. Um, it made sense in theory to me that by bending the elbow, you're kind of kinking all the nerves. But then I also thought about, well, what about the ulnar nerve? And the ulnar nerve's getting stretched out at that point, so that wouldn't that open up the ulnar nerve? And then I read a bunch of research, and it seems like no one seems to have a consensus on it. But you could do either. The only time I've ever done a straight elbow when I'm doing PNF is when somebody's got a splint on their arm. Other than that, I tend to, when I come up and across for D1, I bend when I come up and across, and then when I come down, for D2, I come across. So anytime I cross the body, I tend to bend the elbow. Ugh. You could do it either way, right? But straight elbow definitely is more difficult, and you definitely get more nerve going on, right? Oh, yeah, that's not comfortable. So same thing's going to happen with the knee, especially with the knee. I tried doing the knee last night. I should have recorded it. I fell twice. Um... That sounds like a plan. All right, Daniel. We'll go with that Daniel song. Um, but it's just interesting. I mean, it, it just goes to show you that, you know, I spent multiple years studying PNF, and here I go to talk to, and literally, she talked to me for like 45 minutes about the, the nuances of elbow flexion, elbow extension. And I really, like, I felt like you guys, because at some point I'm just like, Blah, 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 elbow extension. Got it. Um, so that's key, some key things with that question there. I also got some questions about, when we went up here, we talked about approximation and distraction. I got a question from somebody that said, you know, well, when we're talking about approximation and we're talking about traction, are we talking about mechanical approximation and mechanical traction? Or are we talking about manual approximation and manual traction? And what I'll say to that is yes. Either of those can be used in conjunction with PNF. Um, I've actually done PNF with a patient while they're on spinal traction because you can actually get kind of their, their whole improved nerve flow going if you open up that nerve window in the back. And it's 
it's not contraindicated. So you can completely do PNF while you're doing any other therapy. The only thing I'd probably not, or probably avoid doing PNF with is with ice. Because what we've learned through studies is the only nerves that fire better when they're cold are the brain. All the rest of the nerves in the human body fire better when they're warm. And they're, they're like, there's all kinds of neurological studies for that. And why, why does the brain fire better when you're cold? That's why it says it's better to have a cold classroom. So I totally agree with that. I think classroom should be really cold so that you can maintain the best neurological response while learning and not because they get really warm. Um, but the rest of the nerves of the body do better when they're kind of warmed up. And that makes sense, right? Because we talked about that solitary connection, right? Where that nerve, that signal jumps down the nerves. And even in regular old electronics, if the stuff's warmed up, it runs better, right? Your car is a great example. If it's really cold out, it takes a little bit for everything to get going. And even then, it's like you watch, if you watch the battery meter, and if you have one of those, the battery meter's thing that says volts on it, some cars don't have that anymore. But if you watch it, when it's really cold, it's kind of low, and then it'll eventually pick up to that 14 volts where it should be as it warms up. Um, so, and again, with traction and approximation, so approximation, we're literally going to be taking and closing off those joints. So approximation goes along with closed packed, traction will go along with open packed. And sometimes that, that approximation we give the patient can really improve their overall function because if we can get that shoulder more stable, you know, maybe while we're doing D2, if we approximate that humeral head, so that humeral head's making better contact, it might allow them to move a little bit better. But there's a limit on that because we can also approximate it so much that it impinges and doesn't allow that humeral head to rotate. So you have to, it's a real fine line to walk. And then somebody else asked me about the quick stretch because I guess in their facility, they, they've seen people doing this, the quick snap stretch. And is that always needed? And no, it's not. Honestly, if, if I was you guys, I would avoid the quick stretch like the plague until you've gotten either some advanced training or your PT's kind of showing you how to do it, doing that quick stretch, if you don't do it right, can rip nerves off their endings. So you have to understand that there's a specific way it has to stay right in line with the actual PNF flow to do those quick stretches. Um, but we do that anyway, we do ballistic stretching, right? And we, I don't know, if we haven't talked too much about ballistic stretching yet. We're gonna do that in Therex, I think the next is stretching. Um, but what does ballistic stretching mean? When you hear ballistic, what are you thinking? Bouncing, yeah, right? Bouncing stretching, essentially, right? And there are all kinds of studies out there that show what stretching is best. And there are still some studies out there that show ballistic. I've never had really good results with ballistic stretching. Um, you can get really good short-term results from ballistic stretching, meaning that you get a decent, but I find that I get better short-term results out of doing PNF stretching. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, so let's go back to our patterns here. So remember, there's my little picture so I can see that I don't look like an idiot. Well, I mean, I'm gonna look like an idiot, but at least look less like an idiot. There we go. So D1 is what type of pattern? What do, you, what do we call D1? What nickname did we give to D1? Yeah, eating or feed yourself, right? So D1 is going to, we well, can start either direction, right? Eat the apple, throw it away. Eat the apple, throw it away. And again, we can do two arm D1. We can do pattern where we start here and alternate. So remember, that was one of the things that we talked about previously is that by combining those diagonals, right? By bringing them together, right, and moving in conjunction, we can actually simulate flexion and extension of the trunk. And by alternating them, we can actually get rotation of the trunk going. And it almost naturally happens when I'm doing it. And this almost looks like running, right? Wolverine stance, exactly. Just lacking the adamantium, thankfully. Because this chair probably wouldn't hold me. This is not exactly the most expensive chair. All right. So let's 
re go over D1 and D2 again, just for the motion. So that was D1. D2 was called what? What do we nickname D2? Let, what was your class's consensus? D2 was starting here and going up there. Okay, Saturday Night Fever works, right? I always, because of martial arts, I think of drawing the sword and then throwing it away. I don't know why you're throwing the sword away again. But maybe, like I said, your frere and your sword fights on its own, and then you can grab the sword and put it back in the sheath. Right? I'm a huge Forged and Fire guy. I love watching that show. So maybe they're making dancing swords now. If you haven't gotten a chance, watch Forged and Fire. It's a cool show. All right. So doesn't matter where you start. You can start here or you can start here. This is D1 flexion or extension out here. Extension, right? Because remember, it starts at the shoulder. So if I'm an extension of the shoulder, your D1 extension. That comes up into D1 flexion, right? If I start here with my hand across the sword, I'm in D2 extension going to D2 flexion. Again, shoulder's my key point. Your shoulder's gonna be your rotational component. That means it is your key decision on whether it's flexion or extension. So I'm just gonna start out the side and we're gonna move up and across into D1. If you look, we're gonna do shoulder flexion, right? Adduction, external rotation. Right? And when you go into that external rotation right here, that almost moves you right into supination of the forearm. The scapula is elevated, abducted, and upwardly rotated. Otherwise, I couldn't get into flexion. Again, I tend to flex the elbow in this position, but you can leave it extended. That would just look silly. Right? I'm supinated. My wrist is going to flex radially deviate for all the radial deviation that I have, and my phalanges are flexed and adducted, which is also a nice way of saying a fist, right? So fist, this, you're not getting mad and punching the wall, you're flexing and adducting your fists, right? So we kind of end up in this position here. If I can get more flexion, I will, there we go. And then everything happens in the reverse, right? So I'm going to start at the hands because it makes a little bit more sense. I'm going to extend my phalanges. I'm going to abduct them. I'm going to go into pronation, extend my elbow, extend, abduct, and internally rotate my shoulder. And by doing that, my scapula is going to depress, adduct, and downwardly rotate. That is a lot of motion to remember. Getting the majority of the pattern is key, unless you're really working hardcore, you know, neuro pattern where you want specific patterns, getting the pattern down, just kind of this motion here is the most important part because that gets the irradiation going. When you get the rest of the motion going, you'll get the rest of the irradiation going. Um, ulnar and radial deviation is usually the hardest thing to end up in except when you're doing manual, which I'll show you. I've got some videos for manual of doing it with the patient so you can kind of see how it looks when it's done on a patient. But that's kind of the key thing is, is the more hands-on you get, the easier it is to do these motions. And if you remember correctly, what type of a grip are you gonna do while doing these motions? What's your... Yeah, lumbar or duck bill grip, right? And that makes that when you're doing it, it doesn't feel like you're slot, you're punching the patient or squeezing the patient, right? We don't want this type of grip. And what you'll find when we do this in lab is if you use lumbar grip, it's easy to slide. And you're going to, I do a lot of sliding. Dr. Reskin does a lot of relocating. So when she does it, she'll stop at one position, relocate her hands, and go back to the next position. You'll see when I do it, as I'm going through the position, my hands are gonna slide along the arm. And I'm getting them set up for the next position as I finish the position. The only thing I'll warn you, because when getting there, it's this thing. So when you come up and across the body like this, right? Or when you come down and across the body like this, 
There's going to be a tendency because we're going to have to control that elbow. There's going to be a tendency to have your hand on the inside of their elbow. There's nothing wrong with that. That's okay. The only downside is if I have my hand on the inside of this elbow and I come down and across where my hand ends up, right? Because now I'm going to rotate my hand to get a better hold of the elbow. And well, you could see how that could be a problem. I assume, correct? Because now as I'm rotating my hand, I no longer have a hold of my hand. I have a hold of my chest. And especially if you're working, you know, male with female, or even sometimes female with female, you have to be careful of your ending position. When I focus on doing these, my outside hand on my elbow ends up on the outside here, inside up here, outside here, inside up here. And that'll make sense when you see the video itself. But just something to think about, and especially when we get down to the leg, because we're going to be sliding on the thigh between the knees, and you definitely don't want to come up and across and have your hand somewhere you don't want to get it. Just saying. Don't want no surprises. So D2. We're going to start, I'm just going to start D2 here, and we'll go through it, right? So we're going to go into extension. So extension, right, we're going to move into, so here's our extension pattern, move into flexion. So we're going to extend, abduct, right? Extend the wrist, radially deviate. We're going to supinate, extend the elbow, flex the shoulder, abduct the shoulder, right? And externally rotate. And again, you're going to end up in almost a, oh my gosh, I'm to bring the camera up some. You're going to end up almost in a server's position up at the top. Until you come back down, right? So when you come back down, the fingers are going to flex and that duct. This is going to be made, right? The wrist itself is going to flex and ulnar deviate. You're going to bring the arm down, pronation, shoulder extension, shoulder adduction, and inward rotation, right? Here's inward rotation. Here's inward rotation. So let's just get the motion down and learn the techniques first. So let's everyone kind of slide back in your chairs, get yourself some space. We're going to start with D1. So start your arm all the way out to the side. We're going to come up and across, closing your fist and feed yourself. And then we're going to go out and away. Let's just do right arm first, up and across down and away, up and across, down and away. And notice, what are my commands when I'm doing this? Very, very what? I know, it's hard to type. Yeah, very basic, right? I may even, if I'm working with somebody that's got a traumatic brain injury, I may simplify it even more and not even say up and across. I may just go in and out in and out, right? Just to simplify it further for them. So now let's try two hands. So take your hands, start them out to your side. We're gonna bring them up and across together. So up and across into Wolverine position. And I want you to feel your spine when you're doing this. Out and away. Up and across. Down and away. Up and across down and away. Are you feeling your spine moving while you're doing this? Okay, now let's try the tricky one. We're basically gonna be doing the Heisman almost. So start here, down and away, up and across. Up and across, down and away. You should feel a little bit of rotation going on in your trunk when you're doing that. Kind of rolls with it. Did anyone feel any nerve tingling or anything like that while they're doing that one? Anything odd? 
other than maybe a little bit of shoulder. Good, a little bit of shoulder pop. Yeah, I got a little bit of bicep tendon pop when I was doing it. Okay, so now let's do D2. So, gosh darn it, I'm going to slide back some more. We're going to start. We've got two swords in our hands, right? Well, let's actually just start with one hand. Pick us. We started with the right hand last time. I'm going to start with the left hand this time. So, start with the left hand, up and away, down and across. And as much as you can, when you get up to the top, attempt to radially deviate. And then ownerly deviate when you come down here. And now that Erica's here, she might recognize some of these motions if she's functional, right? A lot of these motions, at least in my style, right, exactly, right? That's a block for me, right? Same thing here, that's a block for me in the martial arts. This is loading position, right? This is loading position. So you can see how they definitely have Eastern roots in the martial arts, right? There's definitely some body motion going on. And there's, you know, the, the way we do the martial arts a lot of times is by getting rotational. Because when we do this side, a lot of times this side is going to retract back. Right? And we're getting that rotational component going on to get more force with the block. All right, so let's try double hands here now. So we're going to grab two of our swords. And we're going to go up and out. And our belly's popping out. Surprise! Oh, no more surprise. Surprise! No more surprise. Surprise! No more surprise. Right? Probably that one, that one's the most that gets my shoulder popping is when I get up and out like this. All right, so let's try the opposite. This is, ow, thank you, Dragon. We're gonna try the opposite. So get one hand up, one hand down. Try rotating them. This one's the hardest for me. And again, radial deviation doesn't work very well for me. So overall, those are the motions. So the main thing now from now, once you guys kind of get the motion, again, don't focus so hard on understanding every hand position and every elbow position right now, right off the bat. Focus on just getting the motion down. This is what I've learned throughout the years of doing PNF. If you get lost in the weeds here, looking at the actual positions of the hand, the positions of the wrist, and everything like that, you will get lost in the weeds. So start with just getting the basics down. And that's what we're gonna do when we get together for lab is, we're gonna start not even caring about what hand position we're in. The only thing we're gonna care about is moving them through the motion. And we're probably gonna do that for about a half hour because I just want you to get the motions down. Then we'll start focusing on what the hand does and what the wrist does and what the elbow does once we get those motions down themselves. So here's kind of, again, a much more complex. Some of the people like this. This is out of your book. I don't like this. This is really confusing to me. So that's why I made these little lists here. So there's kind of the picture for you. Okay, the leg. The leg is probably, again, the one that people hate the most. Just because the leg is kind of complex and how to do it and legs are heavy. Um, I guarantee somebody does PNF on my legs or even I'm guessing, you know, Tyler's not exactly the shortest person in the world. Um, so you start moving around his legs, it's gonna get tiring especially if you're working with any form of an athlete, their legs just get 
in your way. So now let me bring this up. I like teaching Therics because I get to be in shorts all day long. All right. It's as far as I can move back. I got to tip it down some more. Good part of having a movable camera. All right. So let's just talk what we called the motions before. So D1 starts away from the body, extended, comes up and across like that, like you're crossing your leg. Down and away, yes, hacky sack, right? Up and across. Down and away, up and across, right? So that's the general motion of D1. D2 starts cross-legged, comes up and out, and down and in. Up and out, down and in. And again, this is one where I call it peeing on the fire hydrant. That's what it reminds me of. Some people call that outside hacky sack. I don't know. I've heard it called river dance. I've actually heard both of them called river dance, but you know, whatever trips your trigger or whatever helps you remember it. So let's just go through the motion of flexion. So is this D1 flexion or D1 extension out here? What's my joint of motion for this? Yeah, this is extension because again, your rotational joint is where you start. It's a lot harder for me to do this when I'm not laying down, but I'm trying to keep it so you guys can see it. So I'm extended back. So flexion is the coming up and across part. Extension is going down and out for D1. So if you notice, as we're flexing, we're going up into hip flexion, we're adducting, and we're externally rotating the left hip. The knee is going to be flexed when you come up here, but you can do an extension again. So you're going to flex the knee, right? The ankle is going to dorsiflex, invert, and the toes are going to be extended. Now, if you look at the books, the, the book will also say the toes should be abducted. Good luck with that. Um, we don't exactly have really strong, <clears throat> really strong muscles for doing abduction of the foot. Really good muscles for doing adduction, closing them off, but not very good for splaying them out. So again, it's gonna come up into flexion, adduction, external rotation, knee flexion, dorsiflexion, inversion, and toes extended. So you're coming up almost like that. And then you're going to extend the hip, abduct and internally rotate the hip, extend the knee, Plantar flex, evert, and flex the toes. Now doing that, I can feel my femoral nerve just kind of screaming at me. Does that make sense, at least in general, for the motion? So out and away, up and in. Out and away. Up and in. Oh my god, my calves are tight. Uh, move toes. So that's D1. Are we okay on the hacky sack? I mean, yeah, technically. <laughs> I guess you theoretically could. Um, I don't know that I have the coordination for that, and that's after years in the martial arts, I don't think I have the coordination to do it. Um, but yeah, it technically could. I mean, you technically can do both legs at the same time, it doesn't work out very well. Um, exactly, a flying kick, right? So, I mean, yeah, I mean, technically you can start, I, I can't get them. up and in, down and out, up and in. What can be done seated? It can, I'm just doing it seated because that gives best show. I take, eh, typically, it's going to be done in supine. Um, I don't know. If, let me see if I can lay down if the camera actually gets me. Get out of my way, chair. Oh, hey, the camera gets me. Right? 
so start here, up and in, down and out. Up and in, this is actually easier than doing it in the chair. Down and out. The only problem is I can't see the camera, that's the screen. I need a screen on my roof now. So that's the D1 pattern. Yep, actually can be done standing. So I can come here, right? I can start here, down and out, up, oh my God. That was my left leg, that was good. And then hips can pop just like that. It can be done in whatever position I want. Just like I could take my good old buddy Theraband here, right? I can make a little bit of a loop. Get a loop and swoop going on here, maybe. That's going to come right out. There we go. I can slip it around my foot and I can hold it. And I could do technically TheraBand with it. So you can pretty much do, it's unlimited what motion you can do it in. Um, I've done these in seated with little old ladies who couldn't lay down and it makes it a little bit easier for them. I've done them in standing. Uh, athletes really hate doing these in standing because that's just not a natural motion for them. So it confuses their brain. All right, so D2. D2 starts across the body Right, and going into the flexion pattern, which is up, we're going to flex the hip, abduct the hip, internally rotate the hip. The knee is going to be flexed up here, dorsiflex, everted, and toes extended. And then we're going to go extension, adduction, external rotation, knee extended, plantar flexed, inverted, and toes flexed. Hips had enough today. And we do, I do have a video to watch. So I'll kind of give you guys an idea what it looks like with a person. All right. So does that make sense at least? So I want to watch the videos that might help you make a little bit more sense. Let me grab my... And I did post the videos already. So let me try to share the computer sound. So here's one of the patterns. Looking at this starting position, what pattern are we doing with this person? D1 upper extremity pattern, right? They're starting in extension. Now I can tell you already looking at this, I don't like the height of the table for this patient. I think she's gonna she's bending way too much, but that's beside the point, it's not my book. For D1 flexion, position the shoulder in extension, abduction, and internal rotation, the elbow in extension, the forearm in pronation, and the wrist and finger in extension. Provide resistance with the index and middle fingers of one hand in the patient's hand and with one hand along the cubital fossa. And what she's doing is a little more resistive than passive. But you can see how that hand on the elbow could get complicated really quick. 
Apply a quick stretch and tell the patient, squeeze my fingers, turn your palm up, pull your arm up and across your face. For the extension pattern, apply resistance to the dorsum of the hand and posterior aspect of the elbow. What a weak quick stretch. Tell the patient, open your hand and push your arm down and out. All right, so that's D1. Let's look at D2 now. For D2 flexion, position the shoulder in extension, adduction, and internal rotation, the elbow in extension, the forearm in pronation. Okay, hold on here. I just want to, before we continue, there's why I said the hand position can be challenging. I would not put my hand in that position, that inside hand that she has. That is just asking for Mr. McKeever to get the other hand in their face as a punch. I'm just saying. You've got to be careful where those hands end up, especially guys, I'm going to warn you. You have to be really careful where those hands end up. And the wrist and fingers in flexion. Provide resistance using a lumbrical grip to the back of the patient's hand, wrapping the other hand under the elbow to provide resistance to the posterior elbow. Apply a quick stretch and tell the patient, open your hand and lift your arm up and out. For the extension pattern, provide resistance with the index and middle fingers in the patient's hand with the other hand on the volare surface of the arm. Tell the patient, squeeze my fingers and pull down and across your chest. As you can tell, her back is bending way too much with this. She obviously did not have a body mechanics class with Dr. Sokel. All right, so now let's look at the legs. So being the fact that this is kind of showing up and across, we're going to be doing hacky sack, which is D1. For D1 flexion, position the hip in extension, abduction, and internal rotation, the knee in extension, the ankle plantar in flexion and eversion, and the toes in flexion. Provide resistance on the dorsomedial surface of the foot and toes on the anteromedial aspect of the thigh. Apply a quick stretch at the foot. Tell the patient, foot and toes up and in, bend your knee, pull your leg over and across. For the extension pattern, provide resistance on the plantar and lateral surface of the foot and posterior aspect of the knee. Tell the patient, curl your toes, push down and out. All right, and then last one, we've got the fire hydrant. Now, she is not starting with the leg crossed. She's moved the other leg out of the way. I tend to start with the leg crossed over. It doesn't really matter either way. For D2 flexion, position the hip in extension, adduction, and external rotation the knee in extension, the ankle in plantar flexion and inversion, and the toes in flexion. Provide resistance on the dorsolateral surface of the foot and on the anterolateral aspect of the thigh. Apply a quick stretch at the foot and tell the patient, foot and toes up and out. Lift your leg up and out. For the extension pattern, provide resistance on the plantar and medial surface of the foot and the posteromedial aspect of the knee. Tell the patient, curl your toes down and in. Push your leg down and in. Now they're all making it look extremely, extremely easy. It's not that easy. I'm going to tell you straight up. 
did the videos at least help make a little bit more sense out of it? And there are probably close to, uh, I'm going to say at least, I Googled last night, there's at least 100 PNF videos on YouTube. So if this doesn't work out, there's a lot of PT programs that do their own videos. You'll look at YouTube, see if there's one that's bet that makes it more sense to you guys. Um, that's just provided by our manufacturer, and they, I think they did. Now, remember, what she was doing was resisted PNF. We're going to talk about the different types of PNF now. So we're going to step away from the patterns now and talk traditionally about PNF itself. And I know if you downloaded this, this was one slide. I separated it out because it was way too small a writing. This is which slide I forgot to change. So the keys for techniques. If I am studying for my boards, I'm studying the patterns. I'm also going to make sure I understand these terms because these terms come back up and will come back to haunt you. So agonist movement. The agonist movement is the motion in which range of motion is attempting to be obtained. So if I am trying to move into hip flexion, my hip flexion is the agonist movement. My antagonist movement is the muscle resisting the motion. So if I'm going into hip flexion, my hip flexors are doing the motion. My hip extensors are resisting the motion. They are my antagonists. Approximation came back here again. The slight compression of joint surfaces by manual compression or weight bearing. So again, approximation is closing off the joint. Manual contacts are where and how the hands are placed on the patient's body, right? How you grip it, what type of grip you use, what you're trying to obtain. You ideally want your hands in the direction that we're going so they can feel that we're going that way. And they understand the direction they're going. When you have your hands a little weird, it gets confusing. Manual or verbal cueing is tactile, or manual cueing is actual touching, right? So manual is tactile proprioceptive feedback cueing given to the patient. So stand up, stand up, stand up straight. Good, good, good. That would be a manual cue, right? I would also be one of my verbal cue being that as well. So I'm tapping, stand up straight, stand up straight. I'm also saying it, which is a verbal cue. Maximal resistance is the greatest possible force that can be applied to a patient while still allowing the patient to move within the range of motion. So a max resistance is almost to 100% resistance where it can't move, but there's still a little bit of motion going on. Very rarely are you going to hit max resistance with patients. And we'll do an example, I'll have somebody max resist me while I'm doing the actual motions on them, and you'll see that it's not easy. Normal timing is the sequence of distal to proximal coordinated muscle contractions during the patterns. So when you're doing this, right, whether you start with the hand and work your way up, or whether you start at the shoulder and work your way down, there's a normal timing for all of that. Meaning if I start with my hand motions, I've got to close my fingers, do my wrist motion, do my forearm motion, do my elbow motion, and then get my shoulder motions going. That's what normal timing means. Meaning that if you start in one, so one direction, you complete out that full movement before you move up the shoulder or up the arm or up the leg. Versus if I start at the shoulder, I'm going to start with my shoulder movements, elbow, forearm, wrist and hand, and fingers. A stretch stimulus is placing of a body segment in a position that lengthens the muscles that are, contract, that, that are to contract during the patterns. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Stretch stimulus works along with those muscle spindles and the Golgi tendons. Stretch reflex, facilitated by a rapid overpressure. Quick stretch just past the point of tension, right? And we talked briefly about those when we were talking about the um, myotatic versus inverse myotatic reflex, right? The myotatic is typically your stretch reflex. The inverse myotatic is the Golgi tendon reflex. Traction is separating those joint components. Verbal cueing is what I'm giving you guys right now. 
I'm talking you through it so that's verbal, but I'm also giving you visual cues because you can see me moving through the motions. And then that manual cue would be me tapping while I'm doing it on myself, right? Okay, good, 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 good. Fire that shoulder, fire that shoulder. You can use a combination of all of those, but let's think logically through this a second. Let's say that I have a patient that is confused and agitated, like most of you might be right now. So they're confused and agitated. Maybe they've had a stroke, maybe they've had a, um, a TBI, something to that effect. Is verbal cueing gonna be very effective? What do you think? To a point, right? As long as I keep those verbal cues very short and very sweet, right? This is not one where I'm gonna be looking, what are you doing, idiot? Why can't you get this right? Blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to drill sergeant mode at that point because all that's gonna do is put that patient's wall up and they're gonna get agitated. And the last thing you want is if somebody's already confused and agitated is to get them more confused and more agitated. Um, that is how sentinel events happen. Because either the patient's gonna throw something at you or they're gonna fall, right? The manual and visual cueing can be very big for those patients. But let's say you have a blind person. Is visual cueing gonna be a lot of help to you? Right? Okay, so what I want you to do is watch me. We're gonna move you through the motion and you're gonna do, you know, watch, watch what I'm doing, pay attention, right? If they're blind, it's not gonna help. Right? If they're deaf, verbal cueing is not going to help. So these are the things you kind of have to think about when you're working with the patient, which ones work. It's going to be a combination of them all for most patients. But in general, you know, there are some reasons why you may not do verbal or visual cueing. All right. So we're going to break things down into movement-based versus stretch-based activities. So a movement-based activity is where we are actually going to continually perform motion. A stretch activity, yeah, exactly, right? A stretch activity is gonna be one where when you get to a position, you are going to hold and lengthen muscles, right? That's the difference between a movement-based and a stretch-based. When you guys see the first one up here, rhythmic initiation, that is a really fancy term for passive range of motion. You are rhythmically initiating their movement. So you're just moving them through the motions. They're not contracting, they're not helping. They're literally just getting through the rhythm, right? You are dancing with them and doing all the work. So you might ask, why would we do rhythmic initiation instead of just doing passive? Well, here's a little secret. A lot of insurance companies don't pay for passive range of motion because they say it's an unskilled service. But when you're doing rhythmic initiation, you're working on neuromuscular re-education. So you can do it. And you can actually bill for this under neuromuscular re -ed. And therefore it's a neuromuscular re-ed form of passive range of motion. You're trying to get those muscles to start firing in the proper sequence. So it is a way to kind of still work with patients that may not be able to move their muscles on their own. So that's rhythmic initiation. That's kind of the start. So when we start PNF with a patient, we starting with the patterns, we're always gonna start them with rhythmic initiation. Even if we're going right into resistive motion, we wanna start with rhythmic initiation because we want them to get the patterns. That is gonna be, right? So you're gonna show them, here's you're doing it, then you're gonna tell them, you're gonna move them through it. That moving them through it is rhythmic initiation, and then you're gonna have them do it. So a couple different motions here. We have reversal of agonist or antagonist or what's called slow reversal or dynamic reversal or slow reversal hold. Wow, that's a lot of terms for the same thing. What reversal of antagonist means is as I'm going down, right? I'm coming up, 
and you're going to move me, and I am resisting your motion. So you're moving me through the motion, right? Reversal of antagonists. So you are literally moving me through the motion, and I'm resisting letting you move me through the motion. I am using my antagonist to resist the motion. So you're going to move me through the flexion component. I am going to be fighting and going into extension. And then when you go into extension, I'm going to be fighting to go back up into flexion. That's firing the antagonist muscles of the direction we're going. Repeated contract, repeated stretch. So repeated contract, repeated stretch are going to be the ones where I am actually moving into those motions. And you're providing me resistance going into the motion. And then at the end, you're going to get a quick stretch going on and getting me going back out in the other option. So this is going to be more agonist motion. So you're going to be firing the muscles that are going in that direction. Does those, do those two make sense at least first now? Right, we got rhythmic initiation, which is PROM. Reversal of antagonists, meaning that as I'm moving it through the motion for you, you're resisting my motion. And then repeated contract, repeated stretch, you are moving me through that motion. I'm resisting you moving into it. So if we're coming up into D1 flexion, right? As a therapist, I'm pushing outward, not letting you come up in. And we get up here, I'm going to get a quick stretch going on and go back out. And I just smack myself in the face. And you guys saw that on camera. The next two. Stabilizing reversals and rhythmic stabilization. A lot of these have to do with postural activities, but they can be used in other than postural activities. So when you think and see alternating isometrics, what I want you to think is linear motion. So if I am going to do Alternating isometrics. I don't like stabilizing reversals. I call them alternating isometrics. It helps me understand what I'm doing. Alternating the isometric. If I'm going to do it on my neck, right, what I'm going to be doing is pushing one direction and tell you, don't let me push you that way. Then I'm going to come to the opposite side, push the other way, push the other way, push the other way, push the other way. I'm running in a line. That's why I said I want you to think of linear motion when you see alternating isometrics. It is a linear motion. Let me get an actual line, right? So alternating isometrics are gonna be moved in a linear pattern. Now that doesn't mean they can't be diagonal. Remember, diagonal is still a line. I can push down and in, up and away as long as I'm staying in a line. That is the setup for rhythmic stabilization. And I think Dylan or somebody mentioned this yesterday that they did with his shoulder. So rhythmic stabilization is you're going to tell the patient, okay, don't let me move you. I'm going to push you around. I'm going to give you perturbations, which is tapping you all around. Don't let me move you. So if I was doing it on my neck and I was the patient and I'm the clinician, I'm going to come in and I'm going to get perturbations all over my neck in different directions and see if that patient can hold the muscle stabilized without doing one of these. So looking at the arm, alternating isometrics. I'm going to push you out and in. Don't let me move you. I'm staying in one linear motion. Rhythmic stabilization. My arm is out. I'm going to move your arm around. I'm going to hit you on all sides. Or I don't want to say hit. I'm going to tap you on all sides. Don't let me move you. Tighten that shoulder up. There we go. Right? So you're kind of moving all around. And with rhythmic stabilization, you're coming from all directions. Right? 
Stabilizing reversals or alternate isometrics, you have a linear pattern you're moving in. If I'm doing the trunk, right, I can sit upright and I can move patient forward and back, that would be alternating isometrics. If I'm kind of smacking them all around and really challenging it, that's rhythmic stabilization. Both these are to work stabilizing effects of the joints that you're talking about or the muscles. Do those make sense? Probably not. That's okay. We'll review them again. And then you have agonist reversal. Agonist reversal are going to be where you're moving through the motion, and when you get to the end, you have an isometric contraction. So I'm going to resist. You're going to get an isometric contraction. It says combination of isotonics and isometrics, right? You're coming out. So you're getting a little bit of motion going along. This one, honestly, almost no one uses. The rest of these we use quite frequently. That is motion-based. The next thing we're going to talk about is hold, relax, contract, relax. And I'm seeing I'm missing a couple up here on this. So now we're going to stretch the patient out. And when we are stretching, are we stretching the agonist? Hold on, Jamie made a question. Let me just read this real quick. Well, I mean, theoretically, no, that's not a problem. I just wanted to read it. Theoretically, that actually is rhythmic stabilization. Because they're making small circles, they're still stabilizing that proximal joint component. What they're doing is, instead of using the tapping and manual feedback, they're using the, the isometric weight of that weight to kind of do a similar motion, right? So they have to hold it through the circle. That's just like you pushing them through it, right? Ball on a wall is another example of almost rhythmic stabilization, right? Because I have to stabilize the shoulder. Um, body blade. The body blade technically is rhythmic stabilization. Actually, body blade would be closer to alternating asymmetrics now that I think about it, because you're only going in one direction, right? Doesn't matter what direction you go in, that body blade is causing you to have to stabilize at the shoulder. So technically, they're not wrong with that. I don't know that I'd call that. I'd just call that circles with the weight. But I mean, I'm guessing probably the reason they called it that way is because they're probably billing neuromuscular re-ed for it. So if I say circles with weight, I'm going to have to label it as therax. If I say rhythmic stabilization with weight, I potentially could bill it as neuromuscular re-ed. Potentially, just saying. All right, stretch techniques. So stretch techniques, when we stretch muscles, are we stretching the agonist or are we stretching the antagonist? So I got an agonist. Do I have any antagonists? Get it? Huh? Huh? Come on, that was kind of funny. So remember, the agonist is the muscle in the direction we are going. The antagonist is the muscle resisting the motion. So if I am stretching somebody into flexion, I'm actually stretching the extensors. Because the antagonist is the muscle we are going to stretch. That is the muscle resisting the motion. So if I am going out into elbow extension, what muscles are my agonists into elbow extension? What muscle is moving me into elbow extension? Triceps, right? So that is the agonist. What is my antagonist or my primary antagonist? The one resisting that motion. 
the biceps primarily. Right? You can break the and break your radialis too, but biceps my primary. So that means if I am going to stretch somebody into elbow extension, I am going to stretch out the biceps. I'm going to stretch out the antagonist muscle. So when you are stretching, you are stretching the antagonist, the muscle resisting the motion. Does that make sense? I know it's pretty simple to say, but it doesn't mean it always makes sense. Because you know, if it doesn't make dollars, it don't make sense, especially now, because almost no one has any coins. Right, so let's look at a different one. If I'm going into elbow flexion, my agonist is what? If I'm doing, if I'm getting suns out, guns out, my biceps are my agonist, right? Triceps are my antagonist and they are being stretched at that point. So they would be the antagonist. Let's look simpler at a finger. Hello, red rum, red rum. All right. So if I am moving into extension, what, are, what muscle is moving me into extension? Yeah, my extensor muscles, right? Good. That means the muscle resisting it, my antagonist muscle, right, are my flexors. So you can do this. So let's look, let's stretch the antagonist. Put your finger at your tip and pull back. You are now stretching your antagonist muscle. Does everyone feel a little bit of stretch doing that? Ah, it feels so good. Don't do that too long. You don't want to hyperextend your fingers too much. Does that make sense? And again, with the hand, most of the time we're going to contract anyway, so it feels good to stretch your hand out. Let's do another one just so that we get it. And again, think muscle groups. Don't necessarily have to think specific muscles. If I am going in to cervical flexion, what muscle, what muscle group are my agonist muscles? Oh, I can see here forever. What muscles are moving me into cervical flexion? ESG. I think it was supposed to be SCM. What is ESG? Okay, again, we got all kinds of them, right? Let's just go group-wise, right? If I'm moving into cervical flexion, my cervical flexors are moving me into it, right? Let's just, let's not get, because we're going to get all confused and get all kinds of group, you know, what is it? Is it SCM? Is it scalenes? Let's just talk group-wise. So the muscles moving me into cervical flexion are my flexors, which would include my platysma, right? I'd have some SCM, I'd have some anterior scalene, have a little bit of traps with very minor amount. Traps are going to really help me more going backwards with reversal of muscle action. Um, you know, maybe some of the, the crack of muscles, but mainly it's just going to be this group that here that makes my triple chin, right? So now I'm here. What muscles then are going to be my antagonists, the muscles that are being stretched when I go forward? That would be my cervical, well, spinae grip would be it, right? But the cervical extensor. So all these muscles in the back of my neck. Is this overloading you yet? Do we need a 10 minute break? Kaylee says yes. Do I have a second for the break? Is anyone else here? Okay. Is anyone else here other than Kaylee? <laughs> 